We begin in Lebanon, where hostilities continue to escalate between Israel and Hezbollah. Israel's carried out the latest salvo in the exchange, and Tel Aviv security officials say the strike has killed a top Hezbollah military commander. Now, the group has not confirmed the assassination, but it has promised severe retaliation. That's after Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah spoke on Thursday about the exploding electronic devices that killed at least 37 people and injured thousands. He said the attacks, which he blames on Israel, are a declaration of war. Let's take a closer look at the escalation between these neighbors. The latest strike taking place in the last few hours, Israel carrying out what it says was a targeted attack on Beirut. The Lebanese health ministry says at least nine people are dead, 59 are injured. Security sources say a senior Hezbollah commander was targeted in that strike. Now, Hezbollah has also pounded northern Israel with more than 100 rockets also on Friday. The group saying it targeted several sites along the border, including multiple air defense bases. The attack is just a day after Hassan Nasrallah vowed to retaliate against Israel for a deadly attack that spanned two consecutive days. Now, earlier, Israel unleashed its heaviest barrage of airstrikes on southern Lebanon in almost a year. It's already accused of being behind the surprise attack that saw thousands of communication devices blow up across the country. Now, TRT World's Priyanka Navani is in Beirut, Rahul Radhakrishnan in northern Israel, and John Brain in Washington, D.C. They're following these developments for you. We're going to start in Beirut with Priyanka now. And uh, Priyanka, you and I have been speaking over the last uh, few hours and several new developments. Take us through the latest. Well, we now understand, according to the Lebanese Ministry of Health, that at least nine people have been injured in this incident and over, I'm sorry, nine people have been killed in this incident and over 60 injured. We do expect that these numbers will continue to rise through the night as they have over the last couple of hours. That being because the area that was hit is a very densely populated area of Beirut. And as we have seen in similar incidents, in similar strikes, in that area, which took place as recently as Tuesday and Wednesday during these pager and walkie-talkie attacks, you cannot target one person without also injuring several others in this area. There are just too many people there for that to happen. Now, Israel has just confirmed that they have killed this top Hezbollah commander, Ibrahim Akil. There is no word from the Hezbollah side yet. If the killing of Fuad Shukud is any indication, that is the killing of the top Hezbollah commander that took place now just two months ago. If that is any indication, then it could be hours, perhaps even a few days, before Hezbollah releases a statement confirming his death. Priyanka, this also adds more fear to people in Lebanon who, over the last few days, have seen this growing escalation. How are people there feeling right now? Absolutely. People are terrified. Every time we hear any sort of siren, be it an ambulance siren, be it a uh, police car, any time we hear the slightest of movements, you know, even from generators, because here in Lebanon there is not proper state electricity. Everybody is using their private generator. Any sound is making people jump right now. People are really on their edge, the edges of their seat, because nobody knows what the next minute is going to bring. This is a country that is experienced with chaos, is experienced with conflict, but nobody has been prepared for what we have seen over the course of this last week. You know, when we talk about the pager attacks on Tuesday and Wednesday, nobody could have predicted these explosions from handheld devices. And so given that, and that we have now seen an attack from Israel so close, you know, all of this is happening within just 72 hours of each other. The fact that we are seeing this happen so close after those attacks is just one more reason that people really do not know what is going to happen. I think a lot of people right now are staying close to home. It's Friday night, so it's a day that a lot of people in Lebanon do like to go out or they like to go to the mountains. That's not going to be the case this weekend. Nobody knows what is going to happen next. They are staying home. A lot of people say that they are just ensuring that there is enough food and water in their homes to ensure that if they need to stay in place for an extended period of time, that they're able to do that. But of course, this is all complicated by the fact that Lebanon has been in economic crisis for the last five 
five years. People are not prepared. People are not equipped. And when I say people, I also mean the Lebanese government. People are not prepared for war right now. They cannot afford war. And I think everybody in the country knows that. And that is one reason that fears are, that is one more fear that is being kind of added to the list. Preparing, it seems, as best they can. And some of that preparation would extend, I imagine, to healthcare facilities in Lebanon, in Beirut in particular. Uh, the attacks that we had earlier this week saw thousands of people injured. Are healthcare facilities and hospitals there able to cope right now with this latest attack? With the latest attack, it seems that they have been able to. For the doctors that I've spoken to, and even the prime minister was one person that really applauded what the health sector has been able to do over the last couple of days. You know, it seems like it has been able to keep up with the traffic. It certainly hasn't been easy. We know that in the last five years, the Lebanese medical system has certainly gone through a lot. It is difficult for hospitals to equip themselves with the proper resources. As I was saying, in the middle of this economic crisis, things as basic as fuel are a little bit difficult to procure. And when I talk about preparations for war, I mean that the government has said that there is only enough fuel in the country to last for four to six weeks. That is not only fuel that would supply households, but that is fuel that would supply hospitals. So that is one of the big questions. When we talk about wider war, would the hospitals be able to handle it? It's not just a matter of doctors and nurses. And by the way, we know that 40 percent of Lebanese doctors and nurses have left the country in the aftermath of this economic crisis. But it's also about what resources are available in the hospital itself. So we have the staffing issues, we have the resource issues, um, but then we just also have the very fact that on Tuesday and Wednesday, and also tonight, people, dozens of people are coming rushing into the hospital at the same time. Now, Tuesday was a bit of a different story because we're talking about 3,000 people injured. Many doctors, including those that worked during the 2006 war, told me that they have never seen something like that. But in the aftermath, it does seem like the hospitals were able to keep up, but you're quite right that many hospitals still remain full, particularly the hospitals in Beirut that are prepared and equipped to do the specialized surgeries that we are seeing needed done after these pager attacks that saw a lot of people lose their eyesight, lose their fingers, um, cause massive uh, traumatic injuries to places like the stomach and like the head. So certainly the attacks that we are seeing tonight, at least 60 people injured is only going to add to the traffic at hospitals in Beirut. But the big question is definitely what is going to be the case for the medical system if we are not only going to see one day, two day, three day, four days of traffic in hospitals, but if this does escalate into a full blown war, are they going to be able to keep up with that kind of traffic? Particularly as we've seen the last couple of days, there may be injuries that doctors have never had to treat before, such as the ones that were caused by these walkie talkie and pager attacks. Priyanka Navani in the Lebanese capital, the site of that latest Israeli attack. Thank you very much. Well, let's bring in our correspondent Rahul Radhakrishnan, who is in northern Israel. And Rahul, where you have been today is the site where Hezbollah has also launched more attacks. It says it hit a military base in Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. What more can you tell us about that? That's absolutely right. An absolute flurry, flurry of activity there at that northern border. But just in the past few moments, we've heard a confirmation from the Israeli military saying that they, in fact, did kill Ibrahim Akil, who is the acting head of Hezbollah's Radwan unit in in that strike in uh, in southern Beirut. That is uh, uh, yet another assassination that uh, that has taken place uh, on the Hezbollah chain of command. But now we've received confirmation from Israel's military saying that they've actually been behind it. And they also added saying they've killed an additional 10 senior Hezbollah commanders. And just to uh, just to go back to what you were saying, there were indeed just shortly after these uh, reports emerged of those strikes in Beirut, there were indeed a volley of attacks in the the occupied Golan Heights, as well as other parts of the Upper Galilee region. This it was certainly uh, uh, many of which were intercepted. Uh, some of those strikes did 
get intercepted over Safad, Rosh Pina, and Kiryat Shimona. These are three areas that we were in reporting from earlier today. And in fact, during that volley of rockets, we too needed to take cover uh, as, as, uh, as we heard the sounds of the siren go off, the warnings go off, and then we heard the intercepting uh, missiles in the sky and the explosions that followed. There was a bit of, uh, uh, it was a bit of a chaotic moment over there in that northern region, but yet again, that is uh, 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 certainly something that has been occurring over, well, in more intensity over the past few days. And of course, as we've been reporting since October the 8th last year. Now, this is the area where the Israeli military says is where their new phase of this war is focused on. They, as you may remember earlier this week, the Israeli uh, security establishment said that their part of their new war goals is also the uh, return of the over 60,000 residents of that northern uh, Galilee region, the northern part of Israel. This is has become a top priority for them. But as we've seen, with these tensions continuing to rise and both sides on war footing, sending missiles and attacks towards each other, the big question was how will Israel seem to uh, bring these people back to uh, to determine that goal of theirs because it does seem very unsafe. But at the same time, it does look like Israel's strategy is now uh, being unveiled with uh, with these continued attacks deeper and deeper into Lebanon. Now, we've certainly heard from uh, uh, the army chief of staff saying there would be, uh, uh, or the chief of staff did hold a number of meetings with the Northern uh, Front Command, and he echoed the sentiment of what the defense minister has been saying, that the only way forward is a military solution. That, in fact, was echoed in a quote that was cited in Israeli media with uh, with an unnamed security official uh, saying that there seems to be for Israel no diplomatic solution to that situation in the north. But as that priority of returning the uh, the residents of the north is uh, remains in place, they are going forward with a military escalation. That is a a, a comment that that is making the rounds in, in the Israeli press. But it all boils down to how that situation is unfolding. And it does seem that Israel is certainly on war footing. Yashini. Raul Radhakrishnan, thank you for that update live there from northern Israel. Now, our North America correspondent John Brain joins me now from the U.S. capital, Washington, D.C. Uh, John, has there been any reaction from the United States on this is uh, latest Israeli strike on Lebanon? Yes, we've heard both from the President Joe Biden and the National Security Spokesman John Kirby, uh, both of them with that fairly familiar refrain now, calling for de-escalation and saying that a diplomatic solution is the only way forward in the Middle East. Uh, Joe Biden said the U.S. is working to get the civilians of both Israel and Lebanon back to their homes in those border areas without giving any details at all and saying or certainly implying that the key to all this is a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, now, he acknowledged that that's unrealistic at the moment or appears unrealistic, but he said a lot of things appear unrealistic until they actually get done. I don't know if the participants and all that will take any comfort from those words. Uh, John Kirby also calling for a diplomatic solution. Notable that he's uh, admitted that the Americans had no prior warning of these latest Israeli strikes. We don't believe the Americans have had warning of any of the Israel's uh, attacks this week at all. Uh, that's quite significant, uh, bearing in mind that they are such close allies. And clearly, uh, suggests that Israel knew that if it had given forewarning to the Americans, the Americans would have tried to persuade Israel not to go ahead at this particularly volatile time. And there is a sense in Washington that uh, American influence on Israel at the moment is fairly weak. Uh, they're not able to rein the Israelis in. And obviously, they have no influence over Hezbollah or Hamas. Uh, so as I say, Washington at the moment pinning so many hopes 
on a ceasefire which appears, uh, certainly from where we're standing, uh, particularly elusive at the moment. Okay, John Brain, thanks for bringing us up to speed with the U.S. reaction live to us there from Washington, D.C. Now let's take a closer look at the Hezbollah commander Ibrahim Akil. He's also known as Hajj Tassin. He was a top figure in Hezbollah's military operations. Born in Lebanon in 1962, he held a key position in Hezbollah's Jihad Council. Now that's the organization's highest military body. Akil led Hezbollah's elite Radwan force, which oversaw major operations, and that includes uh, the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. That was in April 1983. It killed 63 people. Then there was an even bigger attack on a U.S. military barracks, also in Beirut, in October of the same year. That left 307 people dead. 241 of them were U.S. Marines. Now, this led to him being named as a global terrorist by the U.S., who also put up a reward of $7 million for his capture. Now, on September 20th, that, of course, being today, Akil was reportedly targeted by an Israeli airstrike in the southern suburbs of Beirut. That strike, of course, coming amid heightened tensions and an exchange of rocket fire between Hezbollah and Israel. Akil's death follows a series of explosions targeting Hezbollah's communication devices in Lebanon. The situation worsening since October 8th, with the group stating that the attacks will continue until the war on Gaza comes to an end, further escalating regional tensions. Now, to speak more about this, our Nizar Sadawi joins me here in studio. And uh, Nizar, we were talking earlier, of course, uh, about this Hezbollah commander and the importance that he has to this group. We are, of course, waiting uh, for Hezbollah to confirm whether or not mm -hmm. he has been killed. But, of course, he was the target of this Israeli strike. Exactly. And not just him. Uh, I mean, when you look at the hierarchy of Hezbollah, itself. It seems that Israel is adamant to show their own public that they are dismantling Hezbollah the way they couldn't do it to Hamas in Gaza, because this is one of the most important and uh, recently announced objectives of this ongoing war, not just in Gaza, but throughout the region, the Middle East, which is to allow Israeli residents of the north to go back to their homes, the homes they left, or the settlements they left because of this ongoing and constant exchange of fire between Hezbollah and the Israeli army that started since October 8, one day after the Gaza war uh, started. So that's the thing. It seems also that Israel is very persistent in this. They want uh, to keep using the offensive approach rather than the defensive one. So that's why they keep uh, striking Lebanon one time after the other. They started with these uh, threes. Actually, if you look at, uh, at, at this closely, it didn't start two days ago with the explosive devices, with these devices that exploded throughout Lebanon. Actually, it started a long time before that. They killed Saleh al-Aruri. That's something very significant. He was the deputy head of Hamas. They killed him in the southern suburb in Lebanon. That's the very same place where this incident today happened where these airstrikes happened using F-35. Imagine that in an area, as our Priyanka was saying, full of civilians, refugees, mm. all sorts of civilians and people, not just uh, Hezbollah members or supporters. So technically, it started a long time ago. And then you have the killing of Fuad Shukur, a very significant official in Hezbollah. Today, they're saying Hagari, the official spokesperson for the Israeli army, confirmed that's, that, that's the Israel narrative, of course. They confirmed that they succeeded in this strike uh, and killed uh, top Hezbollah officials. It wasn't just Ibrahim Akil. He's saying that they managed to kill 10 other commanders of Hezbollah in the very same strike. So if that, well, I mean, whether that's true or not, whether Hezbollah confirms the killing of Akil or not, Hezbollah is now in a very unique situation where they are obliged to retaliate, to respond. And we're not talking here about the uh, regular retaliation that we have been seeing for the past few months, which is 
to launch barrages of rockets towards northern Israel. Today was very intense in terms of the rocket firing. According to Israeli reports, close to 200 rockets were fired. But that is not, that does not regard as retaliation when, when we're talking about the killing of such a very important figure in Hezbollah, that's allegedly number two in Hezbollah, same as for Ad-Shukur. These, these were the closest two commanders and officials in mm -hmm. Hezbollah to Hassan Nasrallah. So what's next? And I think a very interesting incident that happened was that after he gave the statement, the Israeli army spokesperson, one of the reporters asked, what does that mean for Hassan Nasrallah himself? Is he a target as well? And he literally said, we're not getting into this now. So wh where do we draw a line? That's the question now. Israel will continue with this approach until it becomes an all-out war. That's mm. clearly the main objective of what Israel has been and is still doing uh, in Lebanon. Hassan Nasrallah said on Thursday, this is a red line that has been crossed. So it would possibly stand to reason that he would also be an Israeli target being head of Hezbollah. Of and course. of course, as you said, the question now is, what is Hezbollah going to do? What is that retaliation going to look like? And do they have the capability of launching uh, such a big retaliation just days after these uh, attacks that may have been a blow to them where they still may be it regrouping. Was. It was. Hassan Nasrallah in his latest speech, he himself confirmed that it was a significant blow in terms of security and in terms of the civilian loss. Mm. That's what This is a quotation. This is what Nasrallah himself said. But again, it doesn't mean that they don't have the capability to respond. Now, whether that respond will amount to the extent of how much damage was inflicted upon Hezbollah or not, that's a different question. But Hezbollah has long-range rockets, for example. Not, I mean, Hezbollah did not really use all of their military capabilities until the moment because they have been trying, I think, to keep it calibrated to some extent. And that's why even in terms of what Nasrallah had been saying over the past few months, he keeps saying that they will respond and he also keeps saying that it's all connected to what's happening in Gaza, meaning that mm -hmm. if the war stops in Gaza, calm can be restored in Lebanon as well. But now, I think we are looking at a very different scenario because what happens, for example, let's suppose that Israel agrees to some sort of ceasefire proposal tomorrow or, to, or tonight. Will, does that mean that Hezbollah is not going to respond to the killing of his top Commanders, mm. number two, number three, the series of explosions that went through Beirut even, and very, I mean, the biggest stronghold in Lebanon. We're talking about thousands of injuries, dozens killed. I, I don't believe that Hezbollah is capable of leaving this unresponded to. They have to retaliate. Mm. But I think if a deal takes place in terms of Gaza, the war in Gaza, maybe they will strike a deal with Lebanon, but it will be different somehow. It will take time. And I think that this is precisely what Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, is aiming for. He doesn't want this whole thing to end soon. He wants to buy time because he wants to stay in power and he wants to prove to the Israeli public that he's been able to achieve some of the goals that mm. they've been talking about for months now. Okay, Mr. Arsadawi, thanks for putting that all into context uh, for us and breaking it down. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to get more on the story with Guru Gezar. She's a former retired diplomat, excuse me, and is here in Istanbul. Thanks so much for speaking to us on this news hour. Israel has reached the conclusion that it won't be able to get a diplomatic solution to the situation on its northern border without going through a military escalation. That's what officials have said. What do you make of such a statement? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Well, uh, Israel never wanted a diplomatic solution uh, in the first place because it was never um, content with the outcome of the 2006 uh, Israeli-Lebanese war. And from that time on, it wanted to change the situation. Uh, and uh, we're seeing, um, actually, uh, Netanyahu... Uh, through his rhetoric and through his actions, 
uh, actually uh, trying to change the situation. He's constantly provoking Hezbollah in Lebanon to escalate the war so that he could create a better pretext for himself to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to uh, fully um, attack Lebanon. I don't think that um, he, at any point, thought of having a diplomatic, diplomatic solution, because the diplomatic solution is actually clear. There is the UN uh, Security Council Res Resolution 1701, uh, but this hasn't been uh, applied. Well, you can ask the question, has you know, uh, Israel complied with any of the UN Security Council resolutions that have been adopted in the past? They haven't with regards to Gaza or the West Bank or the, the situation in, in Lebanon. But uh, I think uh, Netanyahu had already uh, decided that he wanted to change the situation in the north of Israel. He started with Gaza, and now there are also uh, hostilities uh, and tensions in the West Bank. And now he's going to go to uh, the north of Israel. They've already uh, stated, uh, Israeli officials, this week that a new phase of the war has started, and they've shifted uh, 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 the center of gravity to the north. That's what they're saying. So what I'm afraid of is that even though uh, Hezbollah will not retaliate in the manner that Israel wants to. I think it would be they have to, uh, but they will. Uh, it will be a, a well calibrated response. So not to escalate the tensions, but nevertheless, Israel will continue with its ambitions to change the reality on the ground. So much pressure on the wider region because many have said, of course, that they don't want a full on war because of the regional implications. Uh, but now many of Israel's neighbors, the so-called axis of resistance, will feel that they may need to get involved because of the escalation. Well, uh, precisely, we're at a very critical juncture. And Israel is waiting. Israel is waiting a response from Hezbollah. Hezbollah uh, is, Israel is waiting a response from Iran, from the Houthis. But all of Iran and uh, the axis of resistance or its proxies are uh, showing utmost restraint at the moment because they don't want to play into uh, Net Netanyahu's, you know, uh, uh, let's say, uh, roadmap or his intentions. They know that if they try to, if they will uh, escalate the war, this will uh, this will only facilitate or uh, Netanyahu to pursue his goals. Look. Uh, we have to be very clear here. We knew from the beginning that this war would not stop in Gaza. It will end in Gaza, but it would not stop in Gaza. Netanyahu has been telling this for a very, very long time. And uh, if uh, he can, if he's able, because there's at the moment no one to stop him, including the U.S., uh, there is no will on the side of U.S. Yes, the U.S. says we need a diplomatic solution. Uh, De-escalation is very important, but they're not doing anything um, concretely. So um, Israel will continue, and Israel might not even stop in Lebanon. Uh, so I think uh, the, the tensions are really high in the region, and I think it's very important for all the sides for uh, the countries in the Arab League, uh, the, the Muslim countries, uh, the US, Russia, China, all to do what it can to really stop the escalation uh, at this point. Otherwise, I don't think Netanyahu will, will stop. He, ha he has no intention to stop. Of course, it's ordinary civilians who feel that the most. Uh, Guru Geza, really appreciate your analysis and speaking to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.